Hi, uh, welcome back to this course on infrastructure finance. Uh, this is lecture 22. So, what we will try and do in this lecture is to try and understand a little bit more about some other elements of project finance markets. Essentially, what we will look at uh, doing in this uh, lecture is to understand the different types of debt, and we also look at another um, commonly used way of uh, mobilizing capital uh, for project finance, which is uh, leasing. But before we do that, uh, let us try and discuss uh, the thought question that we put forward in the previous lecture. So, what we did in the previous lecture is we looked at a specific form of debt, which is called as a mezzanine debt or subordinated debt. And um, we then uh, the question was, are there any potential drawbacks of using subordinated debt? So, if you look at, we really looked at various advantages of uh, using subordinated debt. The main advantages are if you try and uh, use subordinated debt, it increases the internal rate of return for the equity owners. Now, to actually summarize, equity owners provide a part of your capital as straight equity and part as subordinated debt. So, then we looked at uh, various reasons uh, how it can actually benefit. So, when they actually do that, it actually potentially increases the internal rate of return for the, uh, for the sponsors. And second, it also reduces the cost of capital because the cost of subordinated debt is going to be lower than the cost of uh, equity. And then we also uh, found uh, using an example that uh, it helps to avoid a potential uh, dividend trap because uh, of um, the features associated with subordinated debt. In the initial years, companies uh, would be finding it difficult to declare a dividend though they have positive cash flows because the fact that they will be making losses. But when you actually have subordinated debt, the interest payments on subordinated debt will help to avoid the dividend trap that might otherwise arise. So, these are some of the advantages that we have actually seen in the use of mezzanine and subordinated debt, but the question is are there any potential drawbacks of using subordinated debt. So, to answer this let us go back to the example that we discussed again. Okay, so, this was the example that we discussed previously where the total investment was 4000 and um, it was actually financed by debt and the equity portion is coming in two forms as subordinated debt and equity. So, um, we actually looked at um, the various uh, cash flows associated uh, with this project and how uh, the returns are actually going to the uh, investors. I am actually going to go to the um, section which talks about the sponsors pay off when we actually have senior and subordinated debt. So, when we look at the internal rate of returns, um, it is uh, 17 percent when we actually have senior and subordinated debt, but when we actually used only senior debt, it was uh, substantially lower. But now, the question is if you look at the beginning year equity in these years, um, it is actually uh, negative. So, what can this actually mean? So, when a company is having negative equity, technically it cannot uh, function. When a company which is having negative equity, it needs to be dissolved and then the position and, and then the proceeds will have to be repatriated to the investors. So, when a part of the equity holders investment comes as subordinated debt, then the actual level of equity in the company is uh, much lesser as compared to a situation where the entire investment by the sponsors comes in as equity. And when the number of when the amount of equity is uh, lesser, then uh, the beginning year equity can actually become negative very fast as compared to a situation where the entire investment by the sponsors is by equity. And this is a situation if it occurs for the company to sustain the operations additional equity needs to be pumped in. So, that the negative equity turns to be positive. Now, this is a further drain on the investment requirements of the sponsors and it needs to be taken care of. In some countries, regulations do not permit a company to operate with a negative equity and such, um, such regimes needs to, be, uh, needs to be understood properly before we can consider uh, using um, actively subordinated debt to finance a project. So, this is a drawback. Um, of using subordinated debt, uh, which is um, the possibility of equity being eroded um, is real and um, additional sums needs to be pumped in if the company needs to um, if the company needs to function. 
Okay, now let us go back to um, the topic of the lecture. First, we will talk about uh, the type of debt. When we really look at our debt, we consider debt in a very holistic fashion so far, but then um, there are different types of debt. Uh, so, what is going to look, what we are going to look at in today's lecture is broadly the different um, uh, types of uh, types of debt. Uh, we have what is called as a base facility, and then we will talk about um, the working capital facility. Then we also have something called as a standby facility. Uh, then there are some associated uh, characteristics of a loan, which is uh, loan remuneration and loan currency. So first, let us look at um, a base facility. So technically speaking, let's say for example, a company gets a loan sanctioned of about let's say 100 crores. So this is a loan that has been sanctioned. Now, this loan sanction can actually be uh, divided into various categories. Let us say, for example, there is a base facility, which is about let us say 80 crores, and then there is working capital facility, which could be about 10 crores. And then there could be what is called as your standby facility. Okay, so these are all illustrative values just to show you an example. So when we really look at um, uh, the different types of facilities, there are different conditions attached to each of these facilities. For example, when we can actually um, uh, when we can actually use the facility. Um, the kind of um, interest rates for each of this facility, uh, what are the, um, and the, uh, the covenants that needs to be followed for enjoying each of these facilities could be uh, very different. So, though the entire uh, loan portfolio lo loan value uh, is 100 crores, it is further split into uh, different types of uh, facilities. So, now let us look at um, the base facility to start with. So, essentially if you look at, um, um, at the, the total uh, loan amount the base facility constitutes um, the majority of the uh, financing. So, this is a financing that is used to finance construction and um, it will be repaid from the cash flows generated in the operating phase. So, um, essentially this is a phase that is actually used to finance construction and development, but uh, because of the fact that uh, when the project is being constructed or when the project is being developed, there are no inflows to the project, the project does not generate any revenues. So, therefore, the base facility will be repaid. Uh, when the firm starts, uh, when the firm starts generating revenues, or the firm, when the firm starts to begin operations, so though the uh, though the base facility is being utilized uh, during the construction phase, the actual repayment will start happening only during the operation phase. So whenever um, a base facility is being sanctioned, the base facility clearly specifies for the purposes that which it can be used for. For example, is it for construction? Is it for purchase of equipment? Um, is it for um, uh, is it for uh, um, is it for some of the um, other other arrangements like design um, engineering and so on so there is a very very clear specification in terms of um, what the loan can actually be used for and uh, there is very little discretion uh, very little discretion uh, on the part of the spv so for example um, if um, if the equipment cost um, is uh, is actually lower than what has been estimated can the balance actually be used for uh, some other line item. So, that is uh, something that is going to be uh, very difficult and it may actually need to go back to the lenders for their approval before such um, appropriations can be done from one hand to the other. So, the loan uh, is very, very clearly specified for what it has been used for. So, whenever uh, uh, the loan is repaid, uh, it actually reduces the total outstanding uh, of the base facility. So, it is not a revolving credit. So, for example, you actually taken um, 80 crore base facility loan and uh, when you actually repay 10 crores, then the total amount of loan gets reduced to 70 crores. So, it is not something that when you actually repay, uh, you actually continue to enjoy a uh, revolving credit. Um, you will have, to, will have to take a fresh sanction of the base facility as and when you need it. So, in, 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 in some sense, this is different as compared to what is a working capital facility. Now, what is a working capital facility? So, working capital facility is um, a loan which is intended to finance cash deficit 
um, arising as a result of the cash collection cycle. So, one major difference um, that uh, you see a working capital facility as compared to a base facility is working capital facility is largely used when the project begins operations whereas, a base facility is used during the construction and development phase. So, when the plant begins operations um, it needs cash for a variety of purposes for example, um, you know it need to purchase raw material you need to hold it for inventory for certain amount of time and then when you actually sell the product or the service it takes some time for the customer to pay. So, that is something um, called as um, uh, uh, you know accounts receivable period before we can actually start getting revenues. So, there are several ways in which um, uh, the company needs to uh, company needs cash and the working capital facility is essentially a loan arrangement which helps the company to um, to to um, you know to to, un, to to meet good the cash deficit that can arise because of the differences in the cash collection cycle. So, let us kind of look at uh, what could be a cash collection cycle. So, to start with um, let us say the company uh, receives uh, materials right the company receives um, uh, materials. So, in the case of um, let us say a power plant um, the power plant needs to purchase let us say fuel um, like coal and so on. So, there are some raw material that are needed. So, when uh, the plant receives a uh, material and after some time the plant uh, pays the suppliers right that is a payment of suppliers payment to uh, supplier. So, this is what is called as your supplier credit right this is your supplier credit. Um, the supplier is not paid at the same time the company procures the raw material, but it actually has a credit period and then it pays supplier the at the end of it. Let us for example, uh, using uh, using this raw material let us say the company generates power and um, it sells the power generator to let us say the distribution company. So, let us say I, the company generates power at this point in time. So, generation of power and uh, for the power that has been generated the company receives payment at this point in time. So, this is when payment is made by the customer. So, what you actually see is you need a certain amount of cash to pay the suppliers, because there is a delay it is going to take a lot more time for to get the payment by the customer. So, so this is what is called as a, a, a gap in the cash collection cycle. For example, you are collecting cash at this point in time, but cash needs to be paid to the supplier at this point in time. So, this gap needs to be bridged um, by somehow and usually um, this gap is bridged by using what is called as your working capital facility. So, working capital facility is essentially used to meet this gap in the cash collection cycle. So, normally uh, the, this cash collection cycle occurs only when the plant starts to begin operations and that is when we actually use the working capital loan. Uh, the second important uh, feature of the working capital facility is uh, this is usually a, a revolving credit. So, a revolving credit in the sense that you are actually given a credit for a certain amount of time and uh, till that particular amount of time you can continue to use the credit facility and uh, as soon as you replenish it. Let us say for example, the working capital facility sanctioned is 10 crores, okay. the working capital facility sanctioned is 10 crores, working capital facility sanctioned as 10 crores. Now, let us say for example, you have used um, uh, 5 crores out of this to pay the suppliers right? payment of um, suppliers. At time t is equal to let us say 5. Now, you are receiving payment 
from the customers at time t is equal to 10 and when you receive the payment you are actually able to replenish payment from customers at t is equal to 10. So, you are able to replenish the working capital facility using the payment that has been received by the customers. Then at the end of it you actually have a total facility outstanding as a total facility that is available to be utilized as 10 crores. You have taken 5 crores and then you have replenished it and then the facility that is available after the replenishment is 10 crores. Now, you can again continue to utilize the 10 crores whenever there is a, a, a shortfall in the cash collection cycle. You do not have to actually take fresh approvals right, for each and every uh, time that you need to utilize the working capital credit. So, if this credit is sanctioned for let us say 3 years, so you do during the 3 year period you can continue to use any time uh, to the extent uh, that your credit has been sanctioned. Now, if your requirement exceeds the credit facility that has been sanctioned, then in that case you will have to go back uh, to the lenders and ask for an increase in the facility that has been sanctioned. So, for example, uh, when your sanction limit is 10 crores, you cannot make a payment to a supplier out of this credit to the extent of 15 crores, because that is above the limit of the sanction. At any point in time, the total facility outstanding can only be 10 crores and you actually start paying interest only to the extent that you have utilized and for the time that which you have utilized. So, if you have working capital facility sanctioned, but you have not utilized at all, then you do not have to pay any interest. On the other hand, if you actually utilized a working capital facility of 10 crores, but you utilized only 5 crores, then you actually pay interest only for the 5 crores that you have utilized and for the period that which you have utilized. So, in this case for example, you have taken a 5 crores credit out of this working capital facility at t is equal to 5, but you have replenished it uh, at t is equal to 10. So, you will have to pay interest only for this uh, 5, 5 time periods, right? you do not have to pay the interest rate for the entire, uh, entire year and so on. Okay? So, this is about um, the working capital facility. Um, it is a revolving credit in some sense it actually functions very much like the credit card that we actually um, that we actually use. So, you have a sanctioned credit limit you actually start purchasing um, uh, uh, against a sanctioned credit limit and whenever you actually get a bill uh, using credit card bill in a monthly uh, billing cycle once you pay the bill then you continue to enjoy the credit amount that you what originally had. So, it is very similar um, revolving credit uh, a good example of revolving credit is a credit card facility that most of us use. And then as I mentioned before uh, working capital facility can be utilized only after the project begins operations. Uh, next we look at uh, what is called as a standby facility. A uh, standby facility is a facility that is as the name suggests is only available for exigencies and for um, and whenever there are circumstances that has not been predicted. Uh, this is an additional debt made available to cover contingencies that can arise uh, during the project's life cycle. So, for example, uh, suddenly there has been an increase uh, in the equipment cost for various reasons. Uh, suddenly there can there has been um, there has the, 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 there has been an increase in construction cost. So, this were not estimated uh, before during the uh, budgeting during, during the project budgeting. And um, in such circumstances, uh, whenever this kind of events occur, then a standby facility can be utilized. So, if you look at the standby facility, they are broadly classified under two types. Uh, one is um, uh, they are only utilizable to cover the additional costs to those estimated in the uh, uh, to those estimated in the budget. So, whenever um, there is an increase, let's say there is an equipment cost increase, then you can actually utilize the standby facility. The other category is uh, they are only utilizable after the base facility has been uh, completely utilized. Um, see for example, uh, though there could be specific increases in let us say equipment costs or construction costs, but uh, if they are uh, actually uh, compensated by reductions and some other items, then um, the standby facility is not utilized. A standby facility is utilized only after the base facility has been completely exhausted. 
So, in the example that we talked about, let us say for example, out of the total land sanctioned about 100 crores, the best standby facility is let us say 10 crores. If the project is executed as per what has been budgeted, then the standby facility will not get utilized at all, because the project is being able to um, project can be able to uh, use the budgeted cost for equipment, construction, design, um, engineering and so on. So, this will never get utilized, this is there for emergency purpose and uh, to ensure that whenever there is a cost increase, the project company does not go back to the bankers again and search for funds, which can actually delay the project. Uh, so, to ensure that um, uh, the standby facility is being used with uh, prudence, uh, normally the withdrawal of standby facility, uh, uh, there are a lot of restrictions imposed on it. See for example, there has to be special approval taken by the lenders for utilization of the standby facility. Um, a committee of lenders is usually uh, formulated and uh, uh, the project uh, sponsors will have to actually make a presentation as to why they will have to uh, use the standby facility and what were the reasons why the project cost has exceeded the budgeted amounts and so on. So, there are restrictions uh, which are imposed on the project company to ensure that the standby facility is not misused. So, let us um, talk about um, loan remuneration now. So, loan remuneration is nothing but um, the interest that is paid on a loan. So, uh, as we have seen earlier, it consists of two parts, uh, one is your uh, benchmark rate and the other is your uh, spread. So, benchmark rate um, is the benchmark that is normally used uh, to price a loan. So, it could be um, an interbank um, of a rate. So, in the case of um, international, uh, the interbank is uh, that is commonly used is LIBOR, London interbank of a rate. So, in the case of let us say um, of Indian markets, uh, people sometimes use uh, what is called as a Mumbai interbank offer rate called MIBOR. Uh, sometimes uh, the benchmark um, rate is also uh, you know marked to a specific uh, lending rate, something is called as a prime lending rate. So, you have what is called as a benchmark rate. So, the benchmark rate keeps changing uh, depending on uh, various uh, conditions in the economy. So, uh, sometimes um, because of um, um, RBI uh, interventions in the market, uh, the benchmark rates can keep changing. Sometimes because of um, other developments in the market like inflation, uh, um, and the perceptions of um, uh, risk and economic growth and all of this can actually have an influence on inflation. So, the benchmark rates keeps changing uh, based on these changes in the um, marketplace. And then you actually have what is called as a spread. The spread is actually the premium uh, to capture for the project risk. So, if the project is considered to be uh, more riskier, uh, then the spread will be higher. If the project is considered to be less riskier, then the spread will be correspondingly lower. So, normally uh, the loan interest um, consists of a benchmark rate and uh, we, all, we all know that the benchmark rate is not constant, the benchmark rate can keep changing. But what the question that we have now is, is the spread is the spread constant throughout the loan period or the spread also keeps changing. So, it can be both ways, um, the spread can be fixed over the entire loan term or the spread can also vary. But um, the most frequent practice is to actually have an increasing spread with time, that is the spread is not constant for the entire loan term, the spread keeps changing. So, the normal trend that we see is uh, during the construction phase, um, the spread uh, is, is having is, is normally lower and it increases as the project gets into operations. See for example, there is always a step up in the spread once the project begins operations and during the first few years of operation, uh, the spread increases slightly and then it increases further and reaches the definitive level after about 4 to 5 years of operations. So, the, now the question is uh, why does the spread keep um, increasing uh, as the project begins um, operations. So, uh, there, are, um, there, are, uh, there are different ways to actually uh, look at it. Uh, first is uh, when you actually increase, when you actually, uh, when as the loan term increases, the cost of uh, the loan also increases, the long term loan is actually more costlier as compared to short term loan. So, therefore, the spread increases um, as you actually uh, increase the loan term and that is one. 
Uh, second is um, whenever banks are actually making a loan, the banks would actually want to encourage uh, the project company to pay back the loan faster than later. Okay. So, when you actually increase the spread, that is actually uh, giving an incentive for the project company to repay the loan um, at a much earlier date. For example, the project company can refinance the bank loan from some other sources and then settle the loan, thereby taking advantage of um, the lower costs. Um, or, or, or they, or they can avoid the higher costs that can occur if they actually, uh, if they actually repay the loan over a longer time. We also talk about um, a loan currency. So loans can be, um, you know, given in one currency, or loans can be given in uh, multiple currency. And um, in most uh, of the cases, uh, what we see is uh, loans are actually dispersed in the uh, currency of the host country, but there can always be differences. Okay. Um, the loans can be distributed either in the currency of the host country or sometimes in foreign currency as well. Sometimes what you actually have is uh, the loans can be provided in multiple currencies. Let us say for example, you have a loan of 100 crores. Okay. So, this 100 crores is denominated in rupees, but then you can actually say um, 50 crores will be in uh, Indian rupees, the remaining 20 crores let us say it could be in uh, US dollars and the remaining 20 crores uh, could be in euros and the remaining 10 crores could be in Japanese yen. So, we can actually have a situation where a sanctioned loan amount can be dispersed in multiple currencies. Now, why would people want to take loan in this multiple currencies? That is a different thing that we will come to shortly, but you have to be aware of the fact that um, loans can actually be distributed in multiple currencies. So, whenever we have a loan where it is provided in more than one currency, it is known as a multi currency arrangement. But what is the general rule? Um, the general rule is to take loans in a home country currency to avoid exchange rate risk. Um, what is exchange rate risk? Normally what happens is you actually start getting revenues in the home currency, but then when you actually have to repay the loan in a foreign currency, the home currency needs to be converted to a foreign currency and then repay. Now the conversion rate is something that cannot be predicted upfront, and the conversion rate keeps changing. So whenever the conversion rate is not fixed and keeps changing, then the project company is exposed to what is known as a exchange rate risk. So, to avoid um, the exchange rate risk, um, it is normally considered um, to actually borrow only in the currency of the home country. But then there are several reasons why people borrow in a currency other than a home country. For example, sometimes the cost of interest in a foreign currency can be uh, lower than the cost of interest in a home currency. This is very typical of what we see in India. If you actually borrow, um, borrow in rupees, you actually end up paying a much higher interest rate as compared to when you actually borrow in US dollars, because um, the, the cost of borrowing in dollars is lesser as compared to the cost of borrowing in rupees. So, therefore, project companies find it, um, uh, find it uh, appropriate to borrow um, in, 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 uh, in a foreign currency. And whenever they borrow in a foreign currency, they actually do what is called as a they, if they want to actually need, if they, want, if they need the investment in rupees, then they need to convert the foreign currency into Indian rupees. So usually they have what is called as a, a swap contract. So there are banks which offer what is called as a swap contract, where the dollars are swapped to rupees. So when you actually go for a swap contract, there is a cost involved for this swap contract. So uh, you have to consider along with the lower interest cost, you will also have to consider the additional cost of the swap contract when deciding to go for a foreign currency loan. And then there is what is called as your exchange rate risk. Sometimes you can avoid um, the exchange rate risk by going in for hedging contracts. So that is you can hedge and then fix a currency conversion rate. So, whenever you are going for this kind of hedging rates, there is a separate cost attached to this hedging. So, you should not only look at um, the lower interest rates, but you should also account for 
factor in the additional cost for swaps, additional cost for hedging whenever you are deciding on uh, uh, the currency at which you are going to borrow. So, these additional costs are not needed when you are actually borrowing in a home currency, you do not have to actually do a swapping, you do not actually have to hedge uh, against, um, against um, conversion risk. There are other reasons uh, sometimes why you actually um, take a loan in uh, foreign currency. Sometimes when the invoices are in foreign currency, it is better to pay them in a foreign currency. Let us say you actually are importing an equipment from the US and the invoice is that is the invoice made by the supplier is in US dollars, then if you can actually pay the supplier in US dollars by borrowing abroad it actually saves um, a lot of other costs. For example, if you have to actually pay in US dollars and you actually have rupees, then the rupees needs to be converted to dollars using a swap contract and then it has to be paid to the supplier. So, there is an additional cost involved in, um, in the swap contract. So, whenever you have situations like this, then companies sometimes prefer to borrow uh, in a foreign currency. It is also important for to remember in mind that it is going to be very difficult to actually have a hedging contract for a longer duration. The projects have a longer life, so in many cases the loans, the borrowings are also for a longer duration. So, it could be a 5 year loan, it could be a 7 year loan and so on. And if you want to actually hedge the conversion, um, conversion risk, it is not possible to actually find a product for such a longer duration or may possibly actually have a, a hedging product available to mitigate the conversion risk for up to about 18 months or up to 2 years. But longer than that, it is going to be very difficult to find a hedging contract today. So, it has to be done on a rolling basis and whenever it is done on a rolling basis, we are exposing ourselves to risk of the conversion rate that exists at that point in time. Okay, so, the bottom line um, in terms of deciding on which currency to borrow should be based on not just on the interest cost, but it should also be considered the additional costs that are, in, that are involved. For example, you need to look at a swapping contract, you need to look at the hedging contract, account for all these costs when deciding on what kind of um, currency that you need to borrow. Uh, next, we look at um, what is called as a leasing. So, leasing is um, is a form of um, uh, getting capital, but um, in a very different um, in a very different way. So let's kind of quickly look at uh, what is a, a leasing transaction. So you have what is called as your project company. So in, let's start with. Um, a lending transaction. In a lending transaction, there is let us say a bank. The bank provides a loan to the project company, so the project company becomes the borrower. And then in a leasing transaction, there is what is called as a lesser. And then the lesser leases the facility to the project company, and then the project company is known as your lessee. Okay. So, project company becomes a lessee in a leasing transaction, and then a lesser is similar to a lender or a bank in a lending transaction where the lesser provides a facility for the project company. So, what exactly um, is leasing? So, for example, when we actually let us say um, go and lease a house, right, this is very similar uh, in the case of let us say uh, projects as well. We can go ahead and lease an asset from a lesser and then the lesser makes payments and then sorry and then the lessee makes the payments to the lesser to compensate for utilizing the asset. So, in the case of a lending borrower pays 
let us say um, an interest borrower pays an interest for the loan taken and then in the case of a leasing transaction the lessee pays what is called as your lease payments to compensate for utilization of the asset. So, generally you have two types of leases uh, financial leases and operating leases. So, the difference in the sense that um, in a financial lease the lease cannot be cancelled uh, midway whereas, in an operating lease the lease can be cancelled. So, what actually is a leasing transaction let us take for example, you want to actually utilize an asset. Um, for example, it could be a simple case of a car. You can take actually a car on a lease instead of buying a car yourself and then as long as you are using the car, you continue to pay a lease rental to the lesser and on one fine day if you realize that you do not actually need the asset any longer, you can cancel the lease and then you can transfer the asset back to the lesser, the car goes back to the lesser. So, this arrangement is there in many uh, industries today. Let us take for example, you take the aircraft industry, many of the airline companies do not own all the aircraft that they operate, they take it or lease from airline lease air, aircraft leasing companies and then when they no longer need the lease, the aircraft is returned back to the lesser. So, for the period that they actually utilize the aircraft, they have to start making lease rentals. So, we also see this kind of arrangement in shipping companies, many shipping companies do not own the ships that they operate, they actually lease it from uh, uh, leasing companies. So, there are specialized companies that actually provide uh, leasing of uh, these kinds of assets and when you no longer need the assets, you actually give it back. Uh, so, these are all mainly called operating leases, you can cancel the asset and you need not utilize the asset for the entire life of the asset and then there is something called as a financial leases. So, financial leases cannot be cancelled um, in the sense because the lesser in this case is not a traditional a company that actually is in the industry, but the lesser in this case is actually a financial company which actually provides um, which actually provides the asset uh, to the lessee, but it actually provides the financing for the asset on its balance sheet. So, there is, a, there is a difference. So, whenever you are actually let us say taking a aircraft on lease and when you actually give it back, give back the aircraft to the aircraft uh, leasing company, then the aircraft leasing company can lease this aircraft to another airline and it can start receiving lease rentals. But in the case of financial lease, the lease the lesser is not a company which is having any utility for the asset, but it is a financial services company and the financial services company let us say for example, does not have any utility for the asset that it has financed in the leasing transaction. A leasing transaction can be for anything, it can be let us say for example, for a transmission tower. A project company can borrow to construct a transmission tower or it can actually lease a transmission tower that has actually been you know financed by a financial leasing company. So, when you actually cancel a financial lease midway, the asset does not have any use for the company that has you know provided the financing facility. So, therefore, a financial leases cannot be cancelled uh, midway. So, there is another way to categorize uh, in a leasing which is called as a leverage lease or a guaranteed lease. Let us see how this works. So, you have a leasing company so the leasing company finances the asset for let us say for example, in this case the asset is a transmission tower. A leasing company can finance any kinds of assets, let us say for example, it can finance um, uh, let us say um, uh, gas turbines, right. 
So, it can finance let us say it could be boilers. So, essentially the leasing company is a financial institution which provides a financing solution to the project company, but the financing solution is not a debt, but is actually a lease. So, that is the difference between a borrowing transaction and a lending transaction. Now, this leasing company is different from let us say a, a, you know asset leasing company such as aircraft leasing company. So, an aircraft leasing company can lease only aircrafts, it cannot be used for providing a financial solution for any other types of assets. So, there is a difference between a leasing company that provides you know a financial solution vis a vis a leasing company that leases a certain amount certain, certain kind of assets. So, there are many financial leasing companies that we have uh, in India. So, one example is uh, there is a company called IL and F. So, this is um, infrastructure leasing and financial services. So, this um, L is for leasing, right. leasing is one kind of financial service that companies provide. So, a leasing company uh, provides a financial solution for let us say developing a transmission tower. So, let us say if this transmission tower costs about um, let us say 10 crores um, to develop, okay. then the leasing company uh, finances this 10 crores um, from its own sources and also from borrowing from other institutions. Let us say for example, um, the leasing company uh, provides 2 crores um, from own sources and the remaining 8 crores by borrowing from other sources. So, the entire 10 crore is not provided by the leasing company out of its capital, but it actually also borrows from other sources and together it is able to provide the 10 crore needed to develop the transmission tower. Okay. So, this 10 crore is not a lending, but this 10 crore is in terms of a, a leasing. Right. As long as the transmission tower is being used by the project company, the project company will actually start paying lease rentals to the uh, leasing company. But in this case, the leasing company has not financed the asset entirely on its own, but it is actually borrowed. So, therefore, this is called as a leveraged lease. The leasing company has borrowed to provide a financial solution to the project company. So, therefore, it is called as a, a leveraged lease. So, there is something called as a guaranteed lease as well. So, what is a guaranteed lease? Okay. So, in the case of a guaranteed lease, so the leasing company provides um, a financing of the asset to the extent of let us say the whole value of the asset, but then the leasing company gets a guarantee from the bank that if there is any difficulties in getting lease rentals from the from the lessee, then the bank will guarantee um, the return on the investment made by the lease company. So, that is a guaranteed lease. The bank provides a guarantee to the leasing company, so that if there are any problems in the lease rental, then um, the lease, um, then, the, then the leasing company does not suffer a loss or have a problem. So, what are the advantages of a lease? Why do people go for um, this kind of um, a leasing transaction? The first is um, there is a possibility of um, you know getting a solution at a lower cost. Um, a leasing company can in many instances get uh, financing at a lower interest rate as compared to a project company. A project company is a new entity, um, it probably does not enjoy as much um, credit risk or a history as let us say a leasing company. A leasing company could be um, you know a large company it probably has a track record of profitable operations and therefore, it is able to borrow at a much lower rate as compared to a project finance uh, itself. So, when you talk about a leasing company uh, borrowing 8 crores and then providing uh, a financial solution, then a leasing company is probably in a, uh, in a position to borrow 8 crores at a lower rate of interest as compared to the project company itself. So, therefore, uh, 
you know it passes on some of the uh, benefits of the lower cost to the project company and therefore, a project company is able to actually enjoy or able to acquire an asset at a lower cost through leasing as compared to borrowing. Uh, second uh, is uh, when you have a leasing transaction, the assets are not in the books of the borrower, but the in the books of the uh, lessee, but the assets are actually in the books of the uh, lesser, because um, the lesser owns the asset, the lessee does not own the asset, but the lessee just plays a lease rental for using the asset. So, when you actually own the asset, you are able to claim depreciation benefits and uh, depreciation benefits gives you some tax shields, but then you will be able to utilize the tax shields only if you are in a position to if you are paying tax that is when the company is making profits, but in most cases on the project finance companies do not make profits in the early years of the operation. And uh, there is limitations in terms of how much for how many years you can actually carry forward the net operating losses or the tax losses. Uh, beyond a certain point in time you cannot carry over the losses and they actually expire. So, therefore, project companies are not in a position to claim the complete benefits from depreciation tax shields. So, to take advantage of uh, the depreciation tax shields, uh, companies are able to use uh, uh, the leasing transaction. Because the leasing company is a profitable company, it will be able to claim the tax shields of the depreciation of the asset and it can pass on some of the benefits of this depreciation tax shields to the project company as well. And this effectively reduces uh, the cost of acquiring the asset, whenever such depreciation tax shields get passed on to the project company. On its own, the project company because of the losses that are incurred in the initial years may not be completely able to utilize the depreciation tax shields, but by making it as a leasing transaction and by enjoying the depreciation tax shields, by, uh, by sharing the depreciation tax shields between the leasing company and the lessee, one is able to acquire a lower cost of, um, lower cost of finance uh, of acquiring the asset. So, these are some of the uh, benefits of uh, leasing, um, but you should also remember that not all of the assets can be leased. Leasing is not as common as uh, borrowing, uh, leasing can only be used whenever there is an opportunity to utilize the depreciation tax shields, whenever the leasing companies are able to borrow at a lower rate as compared to the project finance companies. Okay, now, we will um, go back um, go to uh, some of the thought questions that we can um, you know discuss um, in the next lecture. Uh, so, these questions pertaining to the topics that we discussed uh, in today's lecture. Let us say for example, uh, the question number one is uh, we have looked at three types of um, debt facility. We looked at the base facility, we looked at the working capital facility, we looked at the standby facility. So, the question that I have for you is generally which of these three would have the highest interest rate and which of the three would have the lowest interest rate. Uh, question number two, when will the project company start paying interest on the base facility loan? Uh, from the time of utilization, from the time of borrowing or after the project begins operations, because we talk that the base facility will have to be repaid out of the cash flows that the project get from operations. If that being the case, when from when does the interest payment start happening from the time of borrowing or from the time of operations. And question number three, apart from the reasons mentioned in the lecture, what could be the reasons for the lower finance costs in a lease transaction as compared to debt? Um, we looked at two reasons in the lecture. The project company is able to, the leasing company is being able to borrow at lower cost as compared to the project company. And two, one is able to completely utilize the depreciation tax shields in a leasing transaction. 
In addition to this, are there other reasons which ensures a leasing transaction has a lower finance cost as compared to debt. So, think about these questions and we will discuss it in the next lecture.